Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the History Consortium's Historic Railroads Week. I can't believe this week has gone so fast, but this is actually our last night of Historic Railroads Week. But we're going to go out with a bang because we've got some great presentations tonight. We've got a program on the Western Maryland Railroad. But don't go offline after that program finishes because we've got a special treat. We've got modeling the Western Maryland Railway immediately following that session. So uh, with that in mind, let's uh, get started with the Western Maryland Railway. Uh, James Shriver III is our presenter tonight. He graduated from Catawba College with a BA where he served on the Board of Trustees and at the University of Baltimore where he earned his MBA. And Jim is an international sales manager in the Asia Pacific area for Hillmar Ingredients. He lives in Union Mills and he's a third generation of the Shriver family to serve on the Historic Society of Carroll County Board. So Jim, take it away. Oh, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. And I'm ready to go. The Western Maryland Railroad, the fast freight line was condensed into just over 800 miles, affectionately known as the Wild Mary. It represents the evolution of railroads and a changing industrial period of our country's history. Next. Originally chartered as the Baltimore Carroll and Frederick Railroad Company in 1852, an additional act in 1853 officially changed the name. On August 11th, 1859, passenger service from Relay House to Owings Mills began using a segment of the Baltimore and Susquehanna. June 15, 1861, it arrived in Westminster. By November 1, 1862, it reached Union Bridge. Next. Many notable Carroll Countyans supported the railroad. Colonel John K. Longwell was author of the charter and helped secure its passage. At a dinner to celebrate the first run in 1859, John E. Smith of Carroll County gave an impassioned speech, Mountains to Kiss the Sea, about future success. Next. During the Civil War years, in the summer of 1863, General Lee's invasions of the North with his Confederate Army is underway. On June 28, 1863, General Meade assumes command of the Army of the Potomac with orders to cover the Capitol and Baltimore as far as circumstances would permit. General Meade recognizes the value of the Western Maryland Railroad for supply and quickly develops a plan, the Pipe Creek Line, stretching from Tawny Town to Manchester, with the railhead at Westminster at the center to block Lee's army if it turns south towards Washington. Days later, as Confederate and Union troops collide in Gettysburg, the Pipe Creek Line is abandoned and the rush is on to Gettysburg. The importance of the Western Maryland Railroad remains. Next. Prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, the Western Maryland Railroad was taken over by the Bureau of the United States Military Railroads, and General Hupt took direct command. Next. His role was considered so important, he had his own engine to travel as needed to oversee operations. Next. Under the general's command, he was able to operate 30 trains a day between Baltimore and Westminster, 15 each way on the single track. Next. Major General John F. Reynolds killed on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. His body was routed through Union Bridge to Baltimore, where it was embalmed, on to Philadelphia, and finally Lancaster, his home, town, where he was buried on the 4th of July. Next. A Civil War trails marker tells the story of General Reynolds' 
last journey. Next. Both Westminster and Union Bridge were used to transport wounded soldiers to hospitals in Baltimore. Tracks east of Union Bridge became known as the Hospital Track. Operations were returned to Western Maryland Railroad on July 7, 1863. Next. After the Civil War in 1868, expansion was underway from Union Bridge West 16 years since the first charter, the Western Maryland Railroad begins to fulfill its destiny. As the B&O and the National Road already had run through Western Maryland, the path for the newcomer was far more difficult. Fortunately, most of the construction took place after better building techniques were developed and trained construction engineers understood how best to design and build a better railroad. Next, tunnel construction benefits from dynamite and concrete, and many were needed through the mountains. Next, bridges for rivers and mountain ravines were first of wood. Next, and later, iron and steel. Next, mountain cuts were made with steam shovels, similar to those used for the Panama Canal. Next. All this construction costs money, and in the expansion years after the Civil War, it was supported by the city of Baltimore as a major investor. $9 million by 1902. In today's dollars, that's $280 million. Next. Leadership of the Western Maryland Railroad was assumed by John Mifflin Hood. It's ironic that a former Confederate officer now heads the train line that was so significant to the Union victory at Gettysburg. He grew the line from 90 miles to 270 miles, added iron bridges to replace wooden ones, improved tracks, purchased 71 steam locomotives with a focus of hauling lumber, coal, ore, iron, steel, and merchandise from Eastern Seaboard factories, passengers from Hillen Station in Baltimore. He maintained an office at Hillen Station that had a bell that would ring three times to notify him of a departing train, as he often rode the tracks inspecting work and Western Maryland Railroad stations. During his tenure of 28 years, he connected the Western Maryland Railroad to the B&O at Cherry Run, West Virginia, the Philadelphia and Reading at Chippensburg, Norfolk and Western at Hagerstown, York, Hanover, Gettysburg, and Chambersburg were all connected. He reached Hagerstown by 1872, Williamsport, Maryland in 1873, which connects to the C&O Canal. John Mifflin Hood earned a statue as under his stewardship, Baltimore recovered their investment just in time to help recover from the great Baltimore fire of 1904. Next. Hood recognized the scenic beauty available to passengers on the Western Maryland Railroad and heavily promoted it. He created Penmore Park in 1877 with the view of 2,000 square miles and two mountain ranges as a destination for passengers. According to the Baltimore Sun, Penmar boasts the best known amusement park of all the Blue Ridge Mountains and doubtless of the East. It was a Coney Island of the Heights to which pleasure seekers from many miles distance came to escape from midsummer heat and to find diversion in various pleasant forms. Next. Blue Mountain House was built for $225,000 in 1883. It had 300 rooms. It was a choice of citizens from the Baltimore area. Unfortunately, it burned to the ground in 1913, but there was no loss of life. Next. Buena Vista Spring Hotel on the Pennsylvania side 
was built in the Queen Anne style, 250 rooms. Rates, $2.50 to $3.50 per day. It was a choice of high-ranking Washington officials. It was a resort of presidents and movie stars, including President Woodrow Wilson and actress Joan Crawford. It also later burned in 1967, after it had been a retreat for the Jesuits who purchased the site during the Great Depression in 1931. Next. The three-tiered high rock observation tower is 2,000 feet above sea level with a capacity of 500 people. Next. By 1907, Penmar consists of the D.C. Mueller and Brother Carousel, a Ferris wheel, pool, bowling alley, movie theater, dance hall, a large dining room, with the chicken dinner for 50 cents, including all the sides and dessert. It has seating for 450 persons at a time. Mueller brothers try to make each horse different. Their elaborate wooden carved horses were stationary, but they were true works of art. Often rumored to have come from Germany, the carousel horses were made in Philadelphia. When the park closed during World War II to be utilized by the United States Army, the carousel was sold to August and Dorothy Karst of Hanover, Pennsylvania. Later it sold for $1,500 to Scrap Iron Slim, Ellie Eggleston of Alaska, where it was shipped. Next. Glen Afton Spring, it served as a popular retreat for young couples. Next. The Little Wabash Railroad was added in 1904. It cost just five cents to ride. Soon it was raised to 10 cents due to its great popularity. This major amusement ride had an estimated over three quarters of a million riders. The three foot high miniature railroad handled as many as 2,000 people per day, and it was run by a former Western Maryland Railroad engineer. Next. Today, the site is Penmore Park with an attitude of 1,400 feet, one of the finest scenic areas in Maryland. It's located on High Rock Road. A multi-purpose pavilion now stands on the site of the original dance pavilion. Next. Locomotives, as everyone knows, are the driving force of a railroad. The selection was an indication of how well a railroad was run and managed. Were the engines up to date? Did the ones selected meet the conditions of the line? Were they well maintained? In the case of the Western Maryland, the locomotives were up to date and first rate. In the early years, male passengers would fill the tender with wood at stops. Next. And of course, there was a Lytle model train version. Next. The locomotives fit the range of track and matched the rolling stock loads for freight and passenger service. As a startup company, the Western Maryland Railroad used wood fire boilers, followed by coal, and finally diesel. And their locomotives were all diesel by 1954. Next. The locomotives had intriguing names. There were Challengers, Potomacs, Constellations, Decapods, Pacifics, used for passenger service, Russians. Russians uh, were 200 ordered by the Tsar. And when the revolution collapsed uh, his government, they were sold to other companies. Alpha Jets, Fireballs, Shays, hammerheads, and big ballots. Next. Manufacturers included American Locomotive. Next. Baldwin Locomotive Works. Next. Electromotive Division of General Motors. Next. 
Lima, next, and Al Alco. This particular photograph shows what was called the circus scheme of colors, red, white, and black. Next. The Western Maryland Railroad recognized that World War II would impact America and shrewdly ordered additional new locomotives in 1940 and 1941, just in time as rail service was essential to the war effort. Though the government did not take over the rail lines like they did during the Civil War, it directed what war materials would be shipped. Next. Rolling stock. There was a fleet of over 10,000 hopper cars, box cars, flat cars, gondolas with the open top. Also, they used piggybacking, popularized in the 1950s, where you put truck trailers on flatbed cars. Many box cars were also from other railroads in transit. Next. Keeping the Western Maryland Railroad the fast freight line often meant using the alphabet route. Created in 1931, it was eight different carriers, Nickel Plate Road, Wheeling and Lake Erie, P and WV, Reading, Western Maryland, Central Railroad of New Jersey, Lehigh, Hudson River, and the New Haven. All this helped to compete against the B&O, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania. This photograph shows oxide red, which became known as boxcar red. Next. The Great Train Wreck. On June 17, 1905, the eastbound freight train was waiting for three westbound trains that had priority to pass. The Union Bridge accommodation, the number 17, passed. Then the Blue Mountain Express, the number 11, passed. All that remained was the Thermont Express number five. Flagman George Lynch had walked a short distance to nearby spring for water. When it returned, the engineers were ready to go. Mr. Lynch looked at his watch and thought, there should be another few minutes before the number five passed. For God's sake, look at your watch. He was waved off. There were two engineers, two conductors, and the firemen, five in all who should have known times and schedules. Unfortunately, Mr. Lynch deferred to his five more experienced crew members. Next. Human error led next to Western Maryland Railroad's greatest tragedy. The three steam monsters were reduced to scrap iron. Many passengers were scalded by escaping steam. There was great loss of limbs. A person on the scene remembers, I helped pick up arms and legs. No one knew for sure who they belonged to. So they told us to give them to anybody who didn't have one that it looked like they belonged to. Next. Barrels of lard burst covering the injured. Rescuers were forced to work knee deep in lard. A relief train from Westminster was dispatched. Injured were transferred to hospitals in Baltimore. The state's attorney of Carroll County decided not to hold an inquest because there was not only the cause of the accident known, but those responsible for the accident had been killed in the collision. Next. 26 died, 11 were injured on that June 17th day, 1905, at Ransom, Maryland. The towns of Thurmont and Kentucky Furnace experienced the greatest loss. The Western Rail Railroad was running a normal schedule two days after the accident. The same day, the dead in Thurmont and Kentucky Furnace were being buried. Next. Other wrecks at Hancock, Maryland, a freight train collided head on with a work train. This time, engineers and firemen on the trains jumped just before the collision. There were no fatalities. Next. Passenger service. 
1913, a contract with the Pullman Company to operate sleepers was established. You had a westbound Chicago Limited and an eastbound Baltimore Limited using the Hillen Station. Running times were very competitive, 21 and a half to 22 and a half hours. It was discontinued in 1917 and with the outbreak of World War I. Afterwards, there was only coach service with trains such as the Blue Mountain Express. Next. They passed through absolutely breathtaking scenery, some of the most rugged topography of the East. Next. A traveler had the comfort of club cars and dining cars. On the internet, for $1,495, you could buy this platter from the original Western Maryland Railroad China service. The last passenger train ran in 1959. Next. Today, there's a scenic run from Cumberland to Frostburg. Next. Train stations dotted the maps of Carroll County and beyond. And there, there were sightings to support businesses as well. Next. Many were all sizes and shapes. Uh, I regret I do not have photos for all of them, but I do have a sampling for you to view. Next. My own family utilized the Western Maryland Railroad to support their vegetable canning operation. The Westminster plant had a siding and was located on the appropriately named Railroad Avenue. The train motif was properly displayed on the label of the Blue Ridge brand. Next. Linwood. Next. Union Bridge. Next. And Union Bridge was also the site of maintenance and repair shops, first for locomotives and cars, later just rolling stock. It was in use until 1964. Next. In 1872, the Western Maryland Ra uh, Railroad arrives at Mechanicstown, soon to be renamed Thurmont, the Gate of the Mountain. There were just too many towns, similar names, Mechanicstown, Mechanicsville, and Mechanicsburg. An official act of the Maryland General Assembly formally changed the name. This became a popular summer resort for the residents of Baltimore. And as a piece of trivia, it's also the first site of friction match manufacturing in the United States. 54. Next. Hagerstown, August of 1872. This would also be the location of their engine repair and refitting operations. Next. Cumberland in 1906. The station is a symbol of its stature. Cumberland was an important transportation hub with America's first highway, the National Road, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, and the B&O Railroad. At the time, it was Maryland's second largest city. Next. There was also expansion into Pennsylvania, which was referred to as the Dutch Line that connected Hanover, Gettysburg, York, and they acquired tracks and stations that transported Lincoln to Gettysburg for the famous address that dedicated Soldiers National Cemetery to the Fallen. West through Maryland Railroad's 100th year anniversary celebration in 1952 included a reenactment of Lincoln's arrival by rail to Gettysburg. Next. George Gold. Another key figure in the history, he was the son of the legendary Jay Gold. He acquired the Western Maryland Railroad through the Fuller Syndicate in 1902. It was to fulfill the dream of his vision of a transcontinental railroad with Chicago as a hub and connections throughout the Midwest. Heavy expansion, along with heavy debt, eventually pushed Gold and the Western Maryland Railroad into bankruptcy. Next. Among his achievements is Port Covington, just south of, Get of 
Baltimore. It is the junction with the world designed for transfer of freight between rail cars and ocean going vessels. It was 190 acres, 75 miles of yard track. It had a coal pier, a grain pier, ore pier for manganese and bauxite, and four general merchandise piers. It could also connect with barges to serve other docks and even reach Sparrows Point, steel mills. Next. The 1959 opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway diminished Baltimore as importance as a grain port. Today's plans are to repurpose Port Covington with offices, apartments, shops, parks. Day one, Maryland will be the reigning largest cybersecurity hub in the world, according to Mike Janik of Data Tribe. Kevin Plank, founder and CEO of Under Armour, conceived the project. He has his headquarters there, his Sagamore Distillery, and there's also now the Baltimore Sun printing plant. Port Covington redevelopment anticipates 35,000 new jobs, billions of dollars of tax revenue. The city of Baltimore, again, is helping with financing with over $500 million in bonds. Next. Oh, next, yeah. Connellsburg, PA. This was a gold for gold. It was a hub for five different railroads. It was the center of the Coke industry for steel production. It was also a way to reach Pittsburgh and feeder lines in PA and West Virginia. Reorganized as the Western Maryland Railroad in 1909, these valuable connections would serve the Western Railroad well. Next. All the small towns along its routes also benefited with transportation, communications, telegraph lines ran the length of the rail lines. You could receive newspapers and your mail. And of course, there was commerce. Next. Decline in the late 1950s began with the interstate highway system and changing ICC regulations. In 1964, the CNO and the BNO were jointly filed for permission to acquire control of the Western Maryland Railroad with the ICC. In 1973, the Chessie System Inc. was formed. The CNO, the BNO, and the Western Maryland Railroad all operate under the Chessie Systems Railroads. In 1983, the BNO actually takes over operation, and the Western Maryland ownership is assumed by the CNO. Next. Tracks are abandoned and later repurposed for recreation. Next. In Hancock, Maryland, you can hike or take a bike on the Western Maryland Rail Trail. Next. Time finally caught up with the Western Maryland Rail Road. Next. The fast freight line no longer had its independence. Next. In 1987, the BNO fully integrated with the CNO, and the CNO merged into the CSX transportation system. Next. Maryland Midland now runs the tracks from em Emory Grove to Highfield, 81 miles of track with a headquarters at Union Bridge, serving Lehigh Cement and others along the tracks. And in turn, the Maryland Midline is now owned by Genesee and Wyoming with a minority share held by Lehigh Cement. Next. In conclusion, the Western Maryland Railroad served a vital role 
in the economies of Maryland and Pennsylvania and the small towns that it connected to the Port of Baltimore. Its management was able and efficient, but it fell victim to the changing business environment. Today, there are economists who believe that railroads would have been better managed as utilities, much like electric companies, to more fairly allocate resources and eliminate duplication. Today, freight in the U.S. is 69% by truck, 14% by rail, globally 90% by sea. I recommend you visit when the opportunity presents itself the Western Maryland Railroad Museum in Union Bridge, or enjoy the recreational benefits of the rail trail and Penmar Park, or perhaps catch a ride at Cumberland. And I'd welcome any questions. Okay, we've got a couple questions for you, Jim. <clears throat> First off, uh, one of the questions that came in was, was the Western Maryland always a standard gauge line? You know, uh, I believe so, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. Um, another question that came in, some rail lines in West Virginia brought kids to school. Did you ever see references to transport of students? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't see that. No, because mo most of the uh, operations were heavily dependent on freight, with the smaller part of the business being passenger. Uh, another question for you, Jim. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Western Maryland uh, had abandoned steam by 1954, which is a little earlier than some of the other local railroads like the Penzi and Norfolk and Re Western. Uh, was the but ma mainly, I believe those other railroads stuck with steam later because they were coal haulers themselves. Uh, how, how did the Western Maryland fit into that that whole scheme? Was it a major coal hauler or was it easy oh, yes, to afford to switch? They definitely uh, hauled coal to uh, the Port of Baltimore. And uh, their upgrade of locomotives was trying to keep modern and efficient. Uh, they wanted to have that fast freight line uh, reputation. Very good. Um, one other, did the, uh, did the Western Maryland in the early days benefit from being, uh, having Herman Haupt and company, uh, uh, <clears throat> did, did, did that, that add anything to the physical plant? Uh, in essence, did the government build anything that benefited the Western Maryland as they were part of that system during the Civil War? Um, actually, they, they really uh, didn't benefit much other than the expertise of scheduling uh, as they were learned how to run so many trains on a single track. Another question we have here, is, the, is there any passenger service remaining? Uh, there's a scenic route that you can catch in uh, Cumberland out to Frostburg. So that, that little section of the railroad you can still ride. Very good. Uh, I believe that's what we have for the questions. Uh, so, Jim, I thank you very much. It's an excellent presentation. And I just want to uh, remind folks, uh, don't go offline yet, because we've got another, we've kind of got dessert to our uh, our main course tonight. And uh, But thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate it very much. And uh, it was an excellent presentation. Well, thank you, Jeff, and I'm glad to be a part of Railroad Week. And I Excellent. hope everyone enjoyed the entire week. Very good. Now, uh, don't don't run off because next we've got David Hughes, who uh, lives in Glendon, uh, Maryland, and he models the Western Maryland Railway, the railroad we just talked about in HO scale, and it's finished 26 by 30 basement. Uh, David was kind enough to invite me down to see the model railroad, and it is amazing. Um, David is modeling what he saw as a, a youngster uh, when he was a rail fan along the, uh, the main line in the late 1960s and through the mid-1970s. And David is a uh, member of the Western Ma Maryland's Railway, Railway Historical Society. And I also noticed when I was down there, he's got several restored and operational 
Western Maryland trackside signals uh, situated on his property. So, uh, David, uh, we've got a great uh, video of your layout. And uh, so it's all yours, my friend. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Amber, do you want to roll that video now? And then I can come back for some question and answer and tell you a little bit about my train layout. Here it comes. Here we go. Sorry about that, folks. Let me try to figure out the sound for you here. go down on the station platforms and watch trains go by. I probably wasn't much older than six or seven or eight at the time. Uh, and that's where I, when I became enthralled with trains and railroading. I built my first small model railroad in a house in, in Guilford in Baltimore City when I was a young teenager, basically just a glorified four by eight sheet of platform with some trains and model cars running around on it. I took a hiatus for probably 35 years having a uh, been married and starting a profession and so forth, just didn't have the time or space for model trains. But I began building what you see here in 2001, uh, and I've been building down here ever since. Of course, with having a display like this in my home, I'm uh, totally into model trains, but uh, my interest in railroading started with the big trains, full-size trains as well. Uh, here in my basement, I model the Western Maryland Railway and having grown up in the Baltimore area and nearby, uh, the Western Maryland traveled this route and I stood trackside as a young lad and a teenager and watched the big trains go by. And that's what got me interested in trying to pursue this here in my home. Where my wife Judy and I live is uh, just a happy accident, quite frankly. Uh, we used to live not far from here and this home was on our route to work every day. And we always admired this house as we drove past it. And one day, lo and behold, we drove past and there was a for sale sign out front. And of course, it just happens to be along the former Western Maryland Railway main line. So as soon as we got to work that day, we called the number that was on the sign out front 
And uh, long story short, within several months, we owned this house. There are a couple of uh, local hobby shops who provide supplies for everything I need. Uh, in addition, uh, roughly four times a year at the Timonium Fairgrounds, there is a train show. They open up the Cow Palace and probably a couple hundred vendors are in there selling all kinds of wares from track to locomotives, to cars, to scenic supplies, uh, electrical supplies, everything a model railroader could possibly need are readily available. In fact, the hobby is very, very strong in this country. Sure, uh, there is expense involved in this hobby like any hobby that someone takes seriously. For instance, a locomotive could cost anywhere from $100 to something more sophisticated that might be $250. Um, a track is not terribly expensive. Honestly, the most important aspect of this hobby is finding the time to do it. Uh, there's lumber involved, there's wire involved, there are light fixtures involved, so, and so forth. Uh, but really what you need is the dedication and drive to pursue the hobby and find the time to create. Within a typical week, I might come down after dinner and spend uh, several hours on the weeknights and on the weekends, depending on other family responsibilities I might have, I might come down here and spend an afternoon on a Saturday or Sunday putting things together. Uh, my wife has a casual interest in trains and model railroading. Uh, however, she is tremendously helpful for me down here in the basement uh, when I have big heavy wooden panels to assemble and screw in place. Uh, and probably most importantly, perhaps you're seeing some of this in the background, uh, my wife paints all the uh, backdrops. The backdrops are painted from slides that I took as a teenager many, many years ago. And she works from those period photographs and paints realistic scenes at all the various sites around the basement so that they are concurrent with the, the scene that is in the foreground. In the hobby, we refer to buildings that are placed around the train layout as structures. Um, Many of the structures on my layout are generic in nature, just used to resemble certain sites in the real world. However, uh, quite a few of the structures that are close to the main line, the track, are, are direct duplicates of structures that existed 40, 50 years ago that I have built either from kits or scratch built to be dead on representations of those buildings. My layout is what is referred to as a double decked layout, which means there is one elevation of diorama around the room that is roughly at 45 inches. And there's another layer, layer of diorama around the room, which is roughly at 60 inches of elevation. The idea is to fit twice as much model railroading into the same space as possible. To get from one level to the other level, Model railroaders use what are called helixes, which are spirals of track, which uh, permit a change in elevation in a relatively small space. Here is one helix here that you can see a portion of one revolution. And here's behind all of this library of all of my Western Maryland goodies here is another helix. There are There is a spiral of track inside of this structure here to get from one level to the next quickly. In the real world, trains have to run through switches to take different routes, and they also pass signals, which are much like automobile traffic lights along the way, which give them various commands as to what route they're taking, what speed to travel. I've recreated that here in the basement. Model trains have to have switches and signals as well. So here's a control panel with two switch controls and two signal controls. And here is the track diagram that these controls control. So I can operate switches and signals just as the prototype does out in the real world. This area right here is required for egress around the basement. But of course, my track plan called for two tracks running from this point to this point. So the, the challenge came, how do we create egress but still allow the railroad to operate? This is what we call a swing bridge. This portion of track here is hinged and it can swing over here out of the way so we can pass through. And then when the next scheduled train is due to come by, we swing this back over here, lock this in place, 
and once again, all is well in the world. Uh, yes, I do open the railroad to the public. In fact, there's going to be a large open house later in the fall of this year. Uh, and I have friends who have model railroads who have been down here to see this. And they have friends, model railroading is a vast network of people. Uh, and they have friends who have never seen this before. So I'll get a call from one of my buddies saying, uh, I've got three people I want to have come over and see your layout. Can we do that next Saturday? And I say, sir. So uh, lots of people have seen what you are seeing here. And I'm delighted to, to uh, let the world see it. I work very hard to accomplish what I do down here. And there's no point in having this if I can't share it with everybody. By nature, I'm a tinkerer. I like to build things. I like to take things apart and repair them and put them back together. Uh, so a model railroad is a great exercise in imagination. I get an idea for how I'm gonna change this scene or how I'm gonna wire this switch to do it better the next time. Uh, and that's what motivates me is just to come downstairs and create something and bring it to life. If I won the lottery, what I'd like to buy is 30 more years of life to try to get this creation completed down here. Even if I got this finished, what you see now, which isn't quite finished, then I've got to go back and do uh, drop more trees in. I mean, just for starters, drop more trees in, weather all my rolling stock, rolling stock are the cars that the locomotive pulls. There are many, many finishing touches that I want to try to finish up before I end up six feet under. Uh, if I have any pride at all in what I've done down here, it's the fact that I've had the perseverance to stick with it for 20 years. Um, my layout still is not finished, although I'm getting close to that point. Um, in this hobby, there are so many disciplines to master. I'm not saying that I've mastered any of them, but I certainly enjoy dabbling in them. We have uh, woodworking in, with regard to cabinet making, building the, the superstructure that holds everything together. There are miles and miles of wire underneath what you're seeing right now. Uh, there are scenery techniques, some of which I've mastered, some of which I can only dream about at this point. Uh, and getting everything to run smoothly. There's a real knack to getting model trains to run smoothly, not stall, not derail, not tip off the track. Uh, so there's a good deal of engineering involved. Uh, and I can just say that if I have any pride at all, it's that I've managed to draw all of that together to some sort of cohesive whole so far. Okay, well, we've, excellent. Very good, Dave. We've we've got some questions for you. Okay. Well, actually, first, we sort of have a, uh, I guess you would say, a, a comment more than a question, and that is, uh, wow, I learned so much tonight. I never heard it talk about model railroading. <laughs> you, you've had a few in your, your day, haven't you, Dave? I sure have. As I said in that uh, very nice video that was prepared for me, by a local uh, youngster here in the neighborhood who did made that video for a college media project. Uh, I've had lots of people come down to the basement. Uh, model railroading is a tremendous hobby, as I say. There are people you can drive past houses you, you've driven past all your life and not know that the, the man or woman who owns that house has a model railroad in his or her basement. We're, we're everywhere, so to speak. And I go to visit lots of people's model railroads. I get inspired by that. What, what they're doing, what their trains look like and all that sort of thing. And I'm happy to have people come into our house and uh, see the same thing. And it just fuels inspiration. It's a wonderful hobby. Fantastic. And, and sort of related to that, we have a question. Who taught you all of this? How did you start <laughs> the hobby? The Time Life book series from 1976. Um, it, you just... I, as I said, I'm a tinkerer. I'm, I, I love electronics. I love woodworking. I love how things look. I like to create dom dioramas that look like something that hopefully resemble the real world. So it's really just an inspiration within that leads. Uh, my father taught me how to use tools and solder wires together. And the model railroading just seemed to fit perfectly. And with my love of prototype trains, uh, for many, many decades, I've always wanted to model the real world in railroading in my basement. And so far, I have achieved that. 
And another question here. Do you have uh, cameras on the trains? The video angles are great. Well, thank you. Yes, I we're not seeing that at the moment, but I do have one locomotive that is fitted with a camera on the front end and on a television screen that you can't quite see in this view. I can see that view. Uh, so it looks as if I can sit in a chair and look at that television screen. And it, I have become the engineer on my train layout in scale at speed. Uh, so I can run the train around the train layout and see all the towns and the scenes that I've created. Uh, and frankly, it looks pretty realistic. So it's a fun thing to do on a Thursday evening, just to pull up a chair and run a train and pretend I'm an engineer. All right. Uh, we have another, I guess this is a question. Uh, when is the next open house? <laughs> right now, where are you all? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, uh, we've, uh, We've imposed on you uh, plenty, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for bringing us into your home, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, personally to to come down and see the layout. As I mentioned to folks, it was truly amazing. And uh, so thank you so much, Dave. Well, folks, uh, that is it. We have finished Historic Railroads Week. Uh, I should let you also know that the History Consortium is a new organization. We've only been in existence for a few months. And it's amazing that we pulled this off uh, being in existence for less than a year. So I hope you all enjoyed Railroad Week. And uh, we are certainly planning to continue to provide some uh, multi-evening educational programs in the future. So on behalf of the History Consortium, thank you so much for, uh, for listening tonight. And thank you for your questions and all your kind comments. And uh, so everyone, uh, happy holidays and hope to uh, you'll see us again when we uh, when we do our next program. Thank you. Thank you.